Okay. Did that. Let's do that. Okay. All right. As I and you guys interrupt me whenever you want, or if something doesn't make sense, uh, uh, just say yo. So um, this class, as we talked about last time, started with Hurricane Katrina. I went over the story with how the class came into being. Um, but, oh, sorry. So, um, so uh, we are going to be checking out this awesome place called Louisiana, the greater New Orleans area. Um, all kinds of, of just amazing history and a really unique, important part of our country. I'm proud that this area is part of the same country as Ventura County and California. Increasingly, our country seems to be about saying you suck and you're from a weird place and I don't like your weirdness. Um, I would suggest to you that that is a dangerous path. I totally can sympathize, empathize with people that at times think that like these people are weird and they're hateful and they're this and they're that, but really our path forward, whatever we want to talk about our country, our planet with climate change, whatever it's together. Fractioning coming apart is, um, in my personal opinion, is not a way to make progress, even though at times I understand the, the, the tendency. New Orleans is a mix. It is an amalgamation. It is a pot of gumbo. And so we'll learn about food, but basically it's just a bit of everything. And so music, history, racism, uh, 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 land purchases, injustice, wonderful invention, all this stuff is a part of this part of our country. And we'll be checking that out in various ways and, and forms as we go through. So this is Kermit Ruffins, uh, uh, that guy I mentioned the very first trip, the, the very first night, the very first trip, the guy that was playing with the, him and his two, his, uh, two other people in his band with just to, just to us, that was Kermit. Um, he uh, smokes an insane amount of marijuana and uh, uh, is, uh, loves bar to barbecue. He loves to eat barbecue and he loves to barbecue barbecue. He, um, this is at a place called Bullet Sports Bar, which I, he doesn't play anymore, I don't think. We still might go to see a show there. But this is basically a basement in, in this residential neighborhood. Um, and so that's him playing there on the lower left. Uh, on the right is one of the uh, really old illustrations of early Mardi Gras. Um, from the, and this, this particular picture is from the 1800s. On the top is us doing, uh, is one of our groups of students making uh, Bananas Foster um, in that pan right in front. And in the middle is our, our friend, uh, Michael Davitz, who, who's a chef, and uh, he's sprinkling cinnamon on that flame. Well, first of all, there's, there's cooking bananas in there. We put alcohol in there. We're burning off the alcohol. And then uh, purely for, I mean, supposedly it gives a little bit of flavor, but mostly for show we're throwing cinnamon on the fire, which makes it sparkle. So that was a magic trick that, that magicians used to do when they wanted to like, you know, on a show and kind of whoosh, and then like throw it into the flame and it sparkles like Mickey Mouse and Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, all of this stuff is uh, New Orleans. All of this stuff is the kind of things, is the kind of stuff we're gonna explore. Um, in terms of the environmental context of the place we're going, um, we could start many different periods of time. Um, but I think a useful place to, to start for us as people that haven't been there perhaps before um, is uh, in the you know, era of the Great Depression, um, 1927, 1928, we had huge floods, huge floods, huge rain events. And uh, notably uh, the Mississippi River um, flooded and it flooded an insane. It was like biblical amounts of flooding, right? And it caused all of these infrastructure problems, all these human problems, death, all this jazz, and it ticked people off. It ticked people off so much that they got really, they, they got really angry. And politicians said, we're going to do something. And so 
uh, there is all kinds of pressure from Florida to Arkansas to the Midwest. People are like, hey, we got to do something. We got to do something. And so this, this, is, uh, this is not 1928. This is, this is Hurricane Betsy in the 60s. But, but, um, but that, that idea, that's what it looked like. Um, and our response was uh, to be humans, particularly male humans that like to change stuff. And they're like, we're going to tell nature what it's going to do. So from the wake of that, that flooding in the late 20s, we start all of these large projects. Egged on by the Great Depression, when all of a sudden there was all this labor force that was out of work. And we're like, what are we going to do? Let's change how water moves over the world. That sounds like a good plan. Sure, nothing could go wrong with that, right? That's the era that we started, you know, the big dams on the Colorado and levying the Mississippi and, and changing the um, a Kiss, Kissimmee River in Florida. All that stuff grew out of this, this crazy time um, with federal money. As a consequence, we have nuked this part of our country. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the lower part of, um, let me turn the lights down, it's a little bit bright in these dark slides. So something like that, and then turn off this. Okay, so you see the state of, you see the, the right here is Louisiana, state of Louisiana, and this blue outline is what we're showing here. This is a, um, a satellite image. And this was uh, generated a while ago. Now, I, I believe this has been updated in the last two, three years, but I don't have the most updated photo. But this is, this is about 20 years ago, but, but it, it, it serves the point. Um, red was stuff that was lost after the era of us starting to, to levy the Mississippi, which we'll talk about in a sec, uh, to 2000. And then the yellow was at the time what was predicted to happen up until 2050. Uh, and the same idea for the light greens, they are the areas where we added wetland, either up to 2000 or pro projected to add land um, uh, up to 2050. And so what you see is, long story short, there's way more reds and yellows than there is greens, right? Uh, than there are greens, I should say. Uh, so uh, actually, first, before, before they do that, let me just make sure we're oriented here. Okay, so here we are. Here's Louisiana, okay? Uh, we talk about the boot tip. So Louisiana looks kind of like a boot, right? So the toes, the tip of your boot right here, this is the Mississippi Delta, okay? Uh, this thing right here, this black line, this is the Mississippi River. Note it's super meandering. It's like curling this way, curling that way, curling this way, curling that way. Goes through, do, 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 do. Here's Lake Pontchartrain, which is not a lake. It's part of the ocean but it's, it's, it's thinly, over here, it's thinly connected to the ocean. So it is seawater, it's sea level, um, but and it, it's salt water, but it, uh, it, it, it seems like it's its own lake, right? Um, there's this massive 60 odd mile um, bridge, uh, is it 60 miles? Maybe it's only like 35, I can't remember. Anyway, but it's, it's uh, the, the Causeway Bridge. There's actually a bridge that goes from New Orleans over to uh, Slobdale, over to the North Shore. We call, we call the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Um, and it's just like the, if you're driving to Key West, if anybody's ever done that, where it's just sort of, you're driving, it's a bridge, but then there's like ocean on that side, ocean on that side, and kind of like, where am I going? Same kind of idea. So you can, oh, if you're looking at a map, you can always find Lake Pontchartrain, that big, the big bullet hole over it. And then right below Lake Pontchartrain is going to be New Orleans. The nickname, for one of the nicknames, there's many nicknames, for New Orleans is the Crescent City. So the Crescent City, because right here, where the main part of the town is, it's a, it's a U shape, it's a, it's a crescent, it's a half moon shape. So if you're ever wondering where New Orleans is, and you look at a map that's, that's just satellite or something, one, first look for Lake Pontchartrain, and then right below it, and wherever the Mississippi is, this sort of bowl, that's, that's New Orleans. Um, so the Mississippi River goes right past New Orleans and then keeps going down and then goes out here. This is the so-called bird's foot delta because it looks like a, a, an, a, an egret's or a um, heron's foot 
or it's kind of splaying out. And if we look, it looks like, oh, here's a little bit of green right here. Here's a little bit of green in what is known as the Atchafalaya Basin. This is where the Mississippi River wants to go now. Um, but almost everything else is red. Red, 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 red. A couple other basic features before we get any more. Um, this is not like our coast, right? It's a very different um, coastal system than California. California, we are a baby, right? We are new, young geologically. One of the reasons we have all these earthquakes is because we have our plate is going north, well, kind of north and west uh, past uh, the Pacific plate is going against the North American plate. So we have all this geologically young stuff. We have Big Sur. We have the Santa Monica Mountains, like up, down, up, down, up, down. It ain't that way here. This is flat land. This is flat, 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 flat. The story I always tell is um, when my wife and I got married forever ago, um, we, were, we wanted to go on our honeymoon in Belize, but we didn't have enough money, so we were poor. So instead, we went to Florida, and we went to the Everglades, which was super cool. I can tell you about that. We were like feeding alligators, frogs, and stuff. It was pretty cool. But um, uh, but we're driving the first time and we're driving into the Everglades and the Everglades Park is, does not close at night. So it's open 24 hours a day, there's no gate. And so we went to this, this one area, it was cool. And they said, hey, come back at night. You can show your dive lights and you'll see all these alligators. Like, okay, cool. And it was a cool story, but um, skipping ahead, as we're looking for that site, I'm driving in and the instructions are like, you know, go here go, and then go past Mount, blah, blah, blah. And then it'll be like a mile past that and you turn left. Like, okay, and we're driving and we go for like, a minute, and nothing. We go for like five minutes, and nothing. We go for like 10 minutes, and nothing. We go for like 15 minutes. My wife's like, I think we passed it. I was like, please, lady, I'm the driver. You don't know what you're talking about. And, and uh, then it's 20 minutes, and then it's 30 minutes. And my wife's like, I told you so. We turn around. And so what had happened was I drove past the mount. The mount was, uh, was um, one foot higher than the surrounding land. So that's what they call the mount in Florida, right? Completely different uh, geography. There it's flat, it's pancake flat, right? So we sometimes have water towers here in California, like in the, in the Central Valley and stuff, but normally we have our water towers just on the hills, right? So if there's a power loss and we want to fight some fires, the, you know, gravity, gravity, we have this water pressure, we can just have that water. In this part of the world, the highest, most of the highest points are these water towers in these different towns. Um, okay, so there's something super, oh, okay, I was gonna say, yeah, so it's flat, it's super flat. And so this is very gradual, very, very, very gradual. Um, so, you know, sea levels here, New Orleans, you know, some of the, the higher ports, parts of New Orleans, you know, maybe, maybe 10 feet above sea level, right? I mean, it's, it's not very high. A campus, we're about 19 feet above sea level right here, like, a, like the base of this building, just to give you a reference. Okay, so um, the other thing we have, they have here that we don't have, is we have this, because it is so shallow, well, that's the other thing, the water here is very shallow, right? Shallow, 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 shallow. So if I'm standing here, um, if, I, if we dr just drive to the coast right now, for Point Magoo, let's say, and I have a rock, I take my rock, and I throw it as hard as I can in the ocean, it goes like, I don't know, 100 feet offshore or something, plunk, and it sinks down, it's going to be, who knows where I throw it, it's going to be like, you know, 35, 40, 50 feet deep, 60 feet deep maybe. If we do that same thing right here, I throw the same size rock, the same distance, the same heft, it's going to go plunk and sink about, you know, two feet deep in the water or so, right? So this is very shallow, 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 shallow waters. So that, and, and so what's going on is the Mississippi River is draining about 40% of the continental United States. Massive watershed, insane watershed. Meaning a raindrop falls in that 40% middle part of the country. And eventually that water is either going to go into groundwater or it's gonna come out here. Historically, all this water seasonally, when, when, when you know, we got in the springtime and, that, and the ice, snow and ice melt and there was flush of water, the river jumped its bank and flooded this whole area. This whole area is a delta. That's why it's so lush. That's why it's such, so, so much fantastic stuff. But we looked at it in the wake of the 27, 28 floods, and we said, well, this sucks. We can't let that happen. 
So we decided to, whereas in places like the Colorado, we put a dam, a wall across the water. What we did here, for the most part, is put levees up. Levees are walls on the sides of rivers. So we contain that water. So the seasonal floods, when the water gets raised, we essentially raise the lips of the, artificially raise the lips of the river, and we held that water in the river. That was a death knell for so much stuff. Um, and so, so there are many reasons, we'll talk about those in a sec, but, but there are many reasons for this, but the number one biggest problem facing our wetlands in Louisiana is the lack of sediment supply. So when that seasonal flooding would happen, as the water would jump the banks, it's muddy, nutrient rich, you know, sediment rich water, and it moves very, and so when the water moves fast, you can carry a bunch of stuff. As the water slows down, you can't really hold big stuff. When water's cranking through, you can be, there'll be boulders in that water, you know, boom, going in the middle. As soon as it slows down, that boulder drops out. So all of this beautiful deltaic area was all created by the river. There's seven major lobes that have, that geologists have identified since the last big glacial period. And essentially they're just, different periods. So there's a big dump here and then the river kind of moves over here. So the river was living, the river moved around just like here in Camarillo. Right now we have three um, year round seasonal coastal waterways. We have right here next to campus, Cayugas Creek. Uh, if we go you know, up coast, the next thing we encounter is the Santa Clara River, one of the largest rivers in Southern California. It starts up even, even beyond Santa Clarita, uh, farther up. Then we have the Ventura River, right? The Santa Clara River created this whole basin. So some years, the Santa Clara River was right here. It was right up next to campus. Other years, it was up near the city of Ventura. And so that, that river just meandered around and jumped all this sediment all across the Oxnard Plain. And that's why it's such a, we have such a fantastic... So a really nice um, area to grow crops would be, you know, so deltas are popular places throughout human history for us to grow things because it's such fantastic nutrients, great soils. A, a killer place to grow in a delta would be some awesome delta deposits that are, you know, three feet, four feet, you know, deep. Some of our deposits here in the Oxnard Plain are 10 meters deep, 30 foot deep of just, you know, deposits. And that's the kind of thing that's happening in the Mississippi River as well. It's muddy, it's silty, but that's what nourishes the area. That's what the ecology is all about. That's what most of our human cultures that, that lived here adapted to that. We changed all that uh, uh, in the wake of this, this flooding. And we decided we knew better and we decided to change the system. So as a consequence, uh, you can see that in red. What does that mean for us? The lower 48 states, Alaska is so massive, we have to kind of keep it in its own category. But, but the lower 48 states, we've lost a bit more than half of all the wetlands that used to exist, uh, say in 1850, call it, called Civil War, Civil War time, founding of California as a state like that era. Lost about half that used to be here. California has the unfortunate distinction, we've lost the greatest proportion, we've lost a greater percentage of our wetlands that were here than anywhere else in the US. So we've lost 91% of our wetlands. We only have 9% remaining. Those, most of those 9% are kind of screwed, right? They're not super healthy and kicking butt, it, but, but area-wise, we still have 9% remaining, right? If we talk about, so California, greatest per percentage, proportional loss of wetlands. Louisiana has the greatest outright quantity of wetlands because almost the whole state was a wetland. So they've lost a bit less than 50% of their historic wetlands, but it's a massive difference. So for us, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of hectares. For Louisiana, we're talking about millions and millions of hectares lost. Um, the factoid is something like a football field every 45 minutes, but that was the old factoid. So it's happening at a faster rate now. That factoid is from about 15, 20 years ago. Um, and so, uh, the factors that are influencing wetland loss here in California are in a big picture, similar to what's happening in Louisiana. Um, and here, as we look at the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, where uh, the San Francisco Bay Area has lost 95% of its historic wetlands around the Bay. 
um, uh, much of it has been outright destroyed, similar to ha what happened with um, Louisiana, hydrologic change. In this case, we filled in a bunch of the area um, uh, and, and made, it no, made it elevated so it's no longer a wetland. Louisiana, we basic, basically lowering the wetlands. We lose them to water. In this case, we lost it to land in most cases. And this was driven by the gold rush, starting with the gold rush. We did so much strip mining of the Sierras, we filled in the bay, basically. Okay, the main things that are, that are causing this huge challenge that are setting the stage for why Katrina was so bad, setting the stage for all this uh, uh, lost homes and businesses and all this stuff in the wake of sea level rise, et cetera, is here. First, okay, so, so um, some of these things are happening every second of the day, every hour of the day, every day of the year. Others are episodic. Others happen in a pulsed type of event. Uh, so we could talk about uh, subsidence. Subsidence is a natural process. Subsidence is where we have the land at, at level X and then it gets lower. Doing nothing, if we just, if we just had a wetland and walked away from it, there, there's a natural tendency to, for subsidence to happen. Why? Wetlands are, um, many wetlands are stagnant water. And that stagnant water means that um, uh, the water can get stratified. The water gets stratified um, and uh, the bacteria that normally break down leaves and twigs and stuff can't do their work. So we go into anaerobic um, uh, metabolic pathways. And that just takes a lot longer. So when we step in a wetland and we, and we smell sulfur, kind of rotten eggs, that's a byproduct of the anaerobic physiological pathways of these microbes. Um, and so what that means is uh, when we have a bunch of water over everything, it takes longer for things to break down. A lot of the soil structure is made up of carbon. It's made up of twigs, leaves, stems, stuff like that of that nature. Eventually, that will break down and it'll tend to compact the soil. There's this natural tendency for subsidence to happen. But then in a natural system that's getting deposition, right, that sediment, that seasonal flooding and stuff, that counteracts the subsidence. Um, so again, there's, there's, an over, there's a general background amount of this that's just happening sort of naturally. Um, uh, but then the other thing we've done is, well, imagine I have a, a, a glass of Coke. I stick my straw in the Coke. I start sucking to drink my Coke. The level of the liquid in that glass is gonna go down, right? That's what happens when we suck out water or oil and gas from, from aquifers and things of that nature. So during our most recent insane drought, we're still in the drought, but, but the last big round of the drought, some areas in the central, California Central Valley dropped one meter. The ground is one meter lower now because we suck. We're so desperate for water. The farmers were pumping out so much water. The land just dropped that much. Same thing can happen if we suck out other materials. And so the, the things here, oil and gas. So oil and gas extraction are absolutely contributing. Even without climate change, even without, even without all the carbon in the air, just the fact that we're physically removing this, this material from the ground means that the, the overall average elevation is getting lower. So those two things are active. So that's, that's subsidence. Next thing is sea level rise. Again, just like subsidence, this is a natural thing. Some of this has gone on forever. We would be in a period of some, some amount of sea level rise anyway right now, but a little teeny bit, millimeters we're talking kind of scale, right? Um, thanks to climate change, that rate is going much higher. So the new report that just came out today says that uh, by 2050, the average sea level rise across the whole US will be about a foot. It's probably gonna be worse than that, but it's gonna be at least a foot. That happens differently in different parts of the country. We in California are getting more of like a half foot um, of sea level rise. East Coast will get more like a foot and a half. So it's gonna vary depending on where we are. But, but so, so we have background and then anthropogenic sea, uh, sea level rise. Then we put the levees on this. So, so those, those first two things, those, that cross, those processes have been going on forever. We've been making them worse, but those, those things are 
part of wetlands throughout history. So as we just talked about, we added in levees, and this was a novel stressor. We never had the river cut off like this before. Um, and so in essence, we've robbed the addition part. So we've kept the minus part. We've kept the taking money out of the bank. We've not been putting sediment money in the bank. And so that's by far the biggest problem. If we could only fix that, we wouldn't solve the loss of wetlands, but it would, it would slow it down by centuries kind of thing. And then uh, one other one that's new is nutria, this guy. So nutria, which, are, which were introduced from South America. It looks kind of like, like a beaver mixed with a rat kind of thing. Um, and so these are uh, massive herbivores. So these dudes love to eat huge amounts of, of vegetation, roots, stems. The lore, there's, there's all, all kinds of stories about where they came from, but they basically got loose in the 30s. People brought them up originally for the fur trade. People started keeping them in cages in and around the swamps in Louisiana. They're like, hey, this is gonna be great. We're gonna like be rich. Long story short, their fur wasn't that great. Um, and so the lore is that a big hurricane came in and broke open the cages and then they're all loose. I'm sure that happened, but it was also a lot of people just starting their, um, it's something like you have beers with people now, their theories as to why the nutrient got gone. But basically, um, what seems more likely is that, yes, yeah, some of that happened, but it was also just like the eucalyptus that we have here in California. We brought them in thinking, we're going to use these for railroad ties. This is going to be great. And then we're like, oh, shit, these don't work for railroad ties. Okay, screw it. And walk away from it. That's probably what happened. People just said, we can't make money on this. Screw it. Turn them loose. Regardless of how we got them, they are a massive invasive species. Huge problem. Um, and so they eat a huge amount of, of um, vegetation and they act as a nucleating center. So uh, it's way easier for wind and waves to start eroding wetland if we start a little hole first. And so it would happen even without nutria, but nutria act like jump starts, like sparks for the fire. Like, choo, 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 choo. How big are they? About this big. They're, they're very big. They're very big. Yeah, so, so it's, like, it's like a small dog. If you saw one killed by a roadkill, you'd think it's like a small dog kind of thing. Um, maybe nails. Orange teeth, big orange teeth. And then the last one are hurricanes. Again, hurricanes, something we've always had, we've always had hurricanes, but because of climate change, our hurricanes are getting more intense and more frequent. And hurricanes, while these other things are going on, subsidence, sea level rise, levees, uh, levee cut off sediment supply, nutria, this stuff is like always going on every day of the year. Hurricanes don't happen every day of the year, right? They're, they're, they're periodic. But with something like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina jumped us, it depends on where we're talking about what well wetlands, but they, they jumped us ahead uh, 10 to 50 years in terms of our wetland loss in that one storm. So, so these intense hurricanes can really have massive effects in terms of our coastal wetland, coastal ecosystems. So these are all the things that are causing wetland loss, right? You'll find that certain groups uh, politically don't like all those answers, so they'll try to emphasize something. Right? Well, yeah, you know, but it's really the levees, right? The people that make the levees are like, well, yeah, but it's oil and gas, right? The reality is it's all this stuff together. But if I had to pick one thing that I could fix, I would, I would um, bring more sediment in. Uh, I, again, all of these things are important. Okay, um, the other thing to mention is we have a very strange sense of much of our natural landscapes. Um, so this is a political map. We tend to see things politically. Natural, it's understandable, right? Um, but this, leads, this gives us misleading perspectives. So here's our map. So this is how we think we should manage these things. Texas has their approach. Florida has their approach or whatever. Let's add a hurricane on here. This is Hurricane Betsy. Before Katrina hit in 2005, this was the last big hurricane that sort of had a dead beat on the city of New Orleans. Look at the track. So the track here, this is a hurricane track. The color indicates the wind speed. So the hotter the, the redder the color, the more intense the wind is. And hurricane, uh, hurricane intensity is fed by uh, warm, hot water. And so as soon as the hurricane, so it was kind of coming up, 
it was sort of like it's heading towards the Carolinas, like, nope, just kidding, cut back, boom, went right past the tip of Florida, came up, boom, hit New Orleans. And then as it gets on the land, you see the wind speed rapidly drops. So it's still a storm, still causing problems, but nowhere near as intense um, wind speeds, et cetera. And then it eventually dissipates. So this is, so a lot of times people say, and we hear this with wildfires with us all the time, we hear this with earthquakes all the time. People say that when the big one happens, when the Thomas fire happens, they're like, well, I didn't evacuate because, you know, it's, I've lived here my whole life. How old are you, 30? Oh, I've lived here my whole life. Never, never had to do that before. And so it's a natural tendency for us to think that way. So the last thing, this is, this is I know it's shocking. This is before I was born. This is true. <laughs> it's true. I'm not that old. Um, anyway, so, so uh, uh, you know, so for me, if I was born in New Orleans, I was born in San Francisco, but if I was born in New Orleans, I would say, oh man, I don't ever remember a hurricane hitting us, hitting our city directly, right? Again, incorrect perspectives. We're using political boundaries. We're using our personal historical memory, not necessarily good guides. These are all the tropical storm tracks from Betsy to Hurricane Katrina. This is the proper way to think about this part of the country, right? So yeah, you lucked out and you didn't have one that hit you smack dab, but come on, right? Please, this is hurricane country. And so pretending it isn't is not a rational approach. I understand why we do it. It's, it I totally get it. But this is how we should be thinking of stuff. So many hurricanes, we, it obliterates the individual state lines because we can't even see them, right? That's how we need to deal with this. And as we go through this class, yes, this class is about Louisiana. We're gonna learn a lot about our friends there. Hopefully you guys are gonna have a connection there for life and, and learn all this kind of cool stuff. But many of these lessons also directly apply to us. So have a look. So these are the these are East Coast Caribbean um, storms. And have a look on the left. I mean, that's not what I was trying to show here, but you see Baja, you see a bunch of hurricanes over there. So we had, so Magoo Lagoon used to have a fishing pier. So in the third, so when that the big floods happened in the late 20s, we had a fishing pier off lagoon. It was a huge draw. People would come from LA, all this kind of stuff. It ain't here no more because the remnants of a hurricane took it out. So we have hurricanes here too, or at least we have the, the onset, the, the, the knock-on effects of hurricanes. And with climate change, we're gonna have more hurricanes. We're more likely to have a hurricane strike us right here on campus. So these things that we're learning in these other places do have direct influence and, and lessons for us here. Okay, so that was one frame of reference. Hey, storms, okay. Oil and gas, oil and gas run the show in Louisiana. Oil and gas run the show in Louisiana. What do I mean by that? Here's a map of Louisiana. Again, even if I didn't, even if I didn't uh, um, uh, put the names on here, we could see Lake Pontchartrain, right? And the right bottom, there's New Orleans. So there we go. Here's the bird, Bird's Foot Delta, Mississippi River. Boom, boom. Okay, so here we go. The, this is oil and gas infrastructure. This is just the piping. This is just the, the, the tubes bringing the oil from offshore onto uh, land. These are all the offshore rigs. For the most part, not exactly, but for the most part, the stuff offshore is oil. These are all the natural gas wellheads on land. And, and most of the stuff on land is mostly natural gas. It is everywhere. It is in national parks. There's natural gas wellheads. It is in people's backyards. It is all over the place. Um, and, and these folks run the show. What, we're not going to get to Hurricane. We're not going to get to uh, Deepwater Horizon today. But but one of the reasons why Deepwater Horizon um, had the effect it did. One of the reasons the the failure and safety culture and all that kind of stuff happened was because, the, in my personal opinion, but I think it's supported by massive amounts of facts and, and two decades worth of work that I've done. Uh, this culture that says don't question these folks. Just during our class, as our class went going, the state of Louisiana changed its constitution to say you cannot hold oil and gas companies accountable for what they say they're going to do. 
So for us right here, if we wanted to put um, an oil and gas wellhead on campus, we would, they probably would be allowed to, but let's just, you know, or say like 40 years ago, someone wanted to do that. They would sign an agreement and say, hey, when you're done sucking out the oil and gas and we pull out that tube, you will repair what happened. We're gonna put some more plants in the ground. We're gonna put some more trees. We're gonna do that, right? Totally. Uh, the, the, the extractors sign this, yes. Here in Louisiana, that same thing. Yes, we're gonna go in, do this extraction, take out oil and gas, and, uh, and then when we're done, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it. No. The vast majority of the time, the companies have just literally walked away. The legal contract they sign with the state and or federal partners literally just walk away. So in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, one, of, one group that was trying to make some headway on this said, hey, one of the reasons it was so bad, one of the reasons our levees failed was this massive uh, 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 storm surge and stuff that came over because our wetlands were so Swiss cheesed out. And they were Swiss cheesed out right where you guys were doing all this oil and gas extraction. So they started making progress. So then the powers that be didn't like that. So they changed the constitution of the state of Louisiana to not allow lawsuits to continue. Very powerful. I, I told you the story last week about me and what happened. And so these guys are very, very powerful. Um, and so, so that's the reality of this part of the world. As a consequence, you guys will see this. So this is down in the bird's foot delta. This is one of our uh, classes from early classes. And what we have as a consequence of all these factors is a hollow landscape, a memory of wetlands. This looks like it's high tide. This could be high tide somewhere, okay? But in fact, it looks like this every day of the year, 365 days out of the year. These are cypress trees, right? These, these sort of classic things, they're called knees, cypress knees. These are, these are um, roots that pop up and essentially act to help aerate the soil because it's so waterlogged that, they have, that they're not as efficient physiologically as they can be. So these, these, these knees, as we call them, help, help the plant do the plant stuff. Uh, cypress trees can be underwater for long periods of time. They've evolved in bogs and things that get wet, but they are a tree. They're not a seagrass. The seeds must germinate on dry land. They must start growing on dry land. If they're underwater their whole time, they will die. And what we're seeing here is the consequence of sea level rise, subsidence, all this stuff together. And so these are all dead trees. But that tree at some point, not too long ago, decades, a century or so, that was, that was land, right? That tree started on land, wetland maybe, muddy land maybe, but still land. Now it's per perpetually underwater. And so we have this, this dead landscape, the skeleton landscape across much of Louisiana. The other thing to say is this was not, uh, we're leading up to talking about Katrina. We're probably going to run out of time today, but that's cool. Um, we'll continue it. Um, uh, what you'll hear, um, starting, so I'm, I'm giving you guys the, the, the big picture right now. We'll go into more depth later. But as new people, as naive people to the system, it's very easy to hear people say something like, oh, of course that person's sake, telling the truth. A lot of the stuff that people said about what happened with Katrina, total BS including, unfortunately, our president at the time, who said nobody could have envisioned this happening. What? 2002, Times-Picayune, newspaper that no longer exists because they pissed off a powerful interest in Baton Rouge, the capital. He decided he wanted to destroy the newspaper, and he did. He bought it and then ran it to the ground. So, uh, New Orleans now has the distinction of the largest American city without a daily, a local daily newspaper. There is the advocate, but that's based in Baton Rouge. Um, so this paper no longer exists. Um, and I used to send you guys the link to this. Uh, I have to figure out how to do it now because the website is no longer active. But basically, this is the Times Picayune, which is the newspaper's name. Um, did an expose, this is 2002, right? Katrina hits in 2005. And this was a hurricane called George that was coming up 
and turned at the last minute and didn't get New Orleans. And so they said, with the help of a friend of ours, um, they said, hey, what would have happened if it didn't turn? What happened if it stayed on the original course? And that's what this red dotted path is. And they predicted all of this failure of levees, all this horrible stuff. This is in the newspaper. This is a several day expose, front page, hardcore graphics, uh, web, web based stories, all this kind of stuff. Like, whoa, if that, if that hadn't turned, we would have had some really bad stuff. Essentially, Katrina did almost this exactly. Katrina was a little bit over here to the right, but by and large, this happened. So again, with so many things, wildfires for us, uh, uh, you know, whatever you want to pick, these are known risks. And the other theme, another, another one of the many themes of our class is that we need to demand better leadership. We need to demand better behavior of our elected representatives and all of us, right? So putting our heads in the sand is a recipe to screw stuff up. And in particular, it'll screw everybody up, but the ones that are gonna be the most screwed are the least powerful folks in our society. It's always been that way, it always will be that way. So it's gonna screw everybody, but it's in particular gonna screw the folks that are the most disadvantaged in society when these disasters happen. Okay. So I'll talk briefly about Katrina. Um, as we were entering the hurricane, unless you guys, you guys need a break? You need a quick break? Okay. So uh, as we're heading into the hurricane season, this is 2005, there was all kinds of warnings that this was gonna be bad. Now, um, our, uh, we have two areas in our country that do hurricane forecasting, two main areas. There's the National Hurricane Center, which is in Florida, and then this atmospheric research group in Colorado. Essentially, they both agreed. We were going into what's called an active decadal signal. There's, there are things like El Nino, Pacific decadal oscillation, these things that are going on over large, you know, years period of time. So we enter into a period of high, hyperactivity, lower activity, whatever. In the case of um, 2005, um, we were in what's called an above, nor above normal scenario and had been so for a decade, meaning in general, we were going to see just, you know, knowing nothing else, we're going to see more than the average number of hurricanes, one. Two, uh, oh, okay, sorry, the, the only time that we deviated from that since we entered that period was were years of El Nino's and we, it was not an El Nino year. So why that gets that has to do with climatology stuff we don't care. It just was very clear that people were saying, "Hey, watch out." Number two, we had warmer than normal sea surface temperature. That sea surface is the fuel for this stuff, so it was really warm water. That was scary. And then thirdly, um, uh, um, hurricanes. Uh, need to spin. So a hurricane is a, is a tropical cycle. Tropical storm, hurricane, major hurricane, typhoon, all those things are the same exact thing. We use different names depending on how strong or weak, uh, they're more intense. And we use different names like typhoons or hurricanes depending on where we are in the world, but the phenomena is exactly the same. It's essentially spinning columns of wind. And so to start, you have to start slowly spinning, start slowly spinning, and then you spin more and more and more and more. So if on that critical early, I'm sorry, I'm selfless. So <laughs> if, we have, if, we have, if we have this critical uh, early starting time, if it's calm, that's when we get the hurricane started. If we have winds, just like, just like you can imagine, like if you're in the bathtub and you took a bath and, and you're watching the water go down and you spin the drain, you spin your finger on the drain, it makes that, it makes that little, cyclone thing, and you don't do anything else, you just sit there, the water it makes that you know cyclone. Rrr. Whereas if it's spinning and then you kind of mush it with your foot or your, your hand, and you break it, it'll stop the thing, right? So that's what was going on here. We, we had, we didn't have strong winds. So we didn't have anything to break it up as it was starting. So, so we had this setting that was primed for intense storms. We had really warm water and we didn't have the typical stuff to break it up. What does that translate to? That translates to, and this is before the start of the hurricane season, this is in the early summer, 
the predictions are we're going to be 175 percent above what's called hyperactive, above hyperactive. So the, all of the hurricane predictions are like, whoa, 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 everybody, whoa, 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 it's going to be really bad this year. This is what Hurricane Trina looked like. So here it is. This is this is a time lapse. So it's coming over, crosses South Florida, and then picks up more intense, more intense. Boom! Forms the eye, and then boom! Right up next to New Orleans again. Here's that. Here's like Pontchartrain. Here's our little visual guide. So New Orleans is right about there. So let's watch that again. So this is this is several days collapse, but spinning, getting more intense, starting to form, becoming more discreet. Boom! Faster, faster, faster. Forms the eye, and then boom. Yeah, that's right. Yep. This is what Hurricane Katrina looked like before it struck. A couple a, a little day or so before it struck. Um, have a look at the size of this thing. So here is Florida. Here is Texas. This thing is a, filling up about half that part of the Gulf. The other thing, and we're seeing this more and more, and these aren't well reflected in our current metrics of hurricanes. The size is changing. The absolute area over which the storm is having a direct impact is they're getting bigger and bigger. So this is a massive storm. All kinds of BS people will try to mislead you with. The first thing that you'll hear is Hurricane Katrina is a category five, which is our highest category of wind speeds. Uh, the category of hurricanes, there's a new a new rating system that I keep emailing these guys every year or two to say, is it official yet? We haven't, they haven't quite formally made an official uh, weather service prediction one. But, but so right now we use this, this you know, category one, category two, category one. That category was based on wind speeds. That category was essentially created by um, Red Cross workers working in Central America that were trying to figure out a way to get help. So they were the folks that disaster happens, they jump on a plane, they fly really quick, they get out, and they start walking around. They're like, oh, how screwed are we? Are we kind of screwed? Are we super screwed? And they were looking for a way to communicate to their bosses, oh, my God, we need to get a million tents here, or do we need a thousand tents, right? That kind of stuff. And they hit upon, in terms of the structural damage, they saw the clearest predictor was wind speed. So as a consequence, we use wind speed to define the size of the storm. We now realize that things like rainfall because of climate change are becoming more important the size. But for now, the, 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 the thing we use is based on wind speed. Category five is, the, is the, the highest number we have right now. So here's some of the bullshit people will tell you. Ah, Hurricane Katrina was a category five hurricane. It's okay. We didn't design the levees in New Orleans to withstand category five. We only designed them to withstand a category three. So therefore, hey, it wasn't our fault, act of God, right? Complete bullshit. It was a category five when it was out here offshore. As it starts heading onto land, it loses power. When the eye of the hurricane makes landfall near Buras, where we'll go uh, in, in the birds for Delta, it was a category three. When it strikes the city of New Orleans, it was a category one. So the levees failed under category one conditions, well within the supposed design parameters that all of you and your parents paid for. That Congress said in the wake of that previous hurricane, 1965 hurricane, when we were going to, you know, floodproof New Orleans, hey, Army Corps of Engineers, design a flood protection system that'll stand a category three storm. We couldn't even do a category one. So yes, it is true that at, at its peak, Katrina was a category five. When it made landfall, only three. When it hit the place where it had the greatest damage, it was only a category one. And this, this type of stuff is very, very common. So folks will say things either because they think it's true or because they're, they're trying to mislead you or they think this. And so again, coming into it from outside, it's hard to know, right? We always want to believe people when they say stuff, right? We're not jerks. We're like, oh, okay, I must be saying the truth but there's a ton of misinformation about what happened with Katrina and not quite as much, but still a lot around the Deepwater Horizon. Okay, so there we go. So we have the initial impact. The first thing that happens is all the outright damage, right? The, 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 the physical 
buildings breaking and, and water flooding and, all, and that, that's obviously very dramatic. Um, uh, this is the impact area. There's a little teeny impact area, not colored red over here on the right hand side, the tip of Florida. These are federal disaster areas. These are areas that are officially beyond the ability of the local folks to, to respond in, in the wake of disasters. So what we have, we have a wildfire, that kind of stuff. But have a look at how big that uh, disaster area is. That disaster area is, and, and I put on, there's California up there for, for reference, right? I mean, that's like, that's about half of the state of California. That's a big area, right? A large area. Um, so we have the initial impact, and then we have the flooding. Now, flooding will happen from a couple different reasons, from, from just the, the, the wall of water that proceeds in front of the storm, from the rainfall it's going to come from the storm, et cetera. Um, in the case of New Orleans, and in, in the case of Katrina, it's really two different things. There's what happens in New Orleans and what happens to the rest of the area. Even if Katrina had not been bad, this always will happen. We have a, an earthquake that hits Southern California, everybody's going to focus on Los Angeles, right? For understandable reasons. That's where the people are, that's where the population center is, that's where all the banking is, that's where the reporters are. It, it's an understandable. Little attention will go to Ventura County. Some attention will go to Santa Barbara because some of those reporters spend summer in Santa Barbara. Little attention will go to Temecula. Little attention will go to Santa Clarita, right? That kind of thing. And so that part of it's sort of a, just a, a natural, always happens with disasters. But the other thing that was going on with this, in this case, was that the levees failed. And so we'll spend a lot of time talking, time talking about the levees failure. The levees were different. So in other places, the impact came, the flooding happened, and it went away the levees were a completely different flavor. So one, New Orleans would get the attention anyway, but the way the disaster, the impacts played out were very different in the urban New Orleans versus the areas, the rural areas, the areas outside of the flood protection area. Basically, we, basically we drown the city. This is LIDAR data, this, this is elevational data, and this is five days after the storm hit, and this is all flooded area. And you'll note that a lot of the flooded area, like right here, it goes right along a hard boundary. That's because the inside of the levee has failed, or, or, or it, there's been a break somewhere in the levee, and it's flooded up to the levee wall. So the, so the, the bowl is full of water. 80% at its peak, 80% of the city of New Orleans is underwater. Um, uh, amazing work to get the city pump dry. So by um, about two and a half weeks later, much of the city is still pumped out. There still are areas that are red here. There still are areas that still have standing water, right? Three weeks after the flood. Um, but when this first happened, people were talking six months. Take six months to get it watered out. This was an insane amount of work to get this done. Um, all kinds of impacts. So this is um, a guy who's in his house and you can see how much water is around his house. And he said, well, I knew it was time to leave as a reporter come by asking, I knew it was time to leave when the skin on my fingers and legs started to peel off, right? Hard to explain how crazy this was, right? Um, there's, there's several documentaries I want to suggest you guys watch that, that, that go through this really, really well. Um, the first one I think it's good to watch is one called The Storm, which was, which was made just a few weeks, month, or, month and a half after Katrina hit. Um, really, I think, sets the tone for what happened. It was very raw still. There were parts of New Orleans that were still wet when this documentary was released. Um, uh, in the wake of this total utter fiasco, total other, total failure of our society, we start to see social challenges, as you would understand, as, as you would guess. Um, a lot of this is misinterpreted. A lot of this is improperly interpreted at the time, just because of the chaos of whatever and people's biases and this and that. 
but a lot of it um, has, has got, got stuck. So we find with disasters or crises or whatever, a lot of times that first impression is what people hear about and it gets, it sticks in their head. These are folks going into, I can't remember, these are a Walmart, this is a security guard, the shotgun. He's not stopping people going in there. He's saying, hey, take your time. This is mostly people going in to get diapers, going in to get water, right? You're not stopping them getting diapers and water. He's like, hey, hey, settle down, settle down, settle down. Um, yes, there were some folks like right here that were pulling out shirts and shoes, but by and large, uh, that absolutely happened. But by and large, that was a small part of the story, right? This is, so we have, we have this is a, the 10, we'll be driving on the 10 freeway a lot more there. This is, um, this is a freeway and this is an off, off ramp. Uh, any guesses as to what we're looking at here? These folks on that, on that ramp. This is about, this picture I think is about three days after the hurricane hit. Yes, but more specifically, good. You're right, yeah, so, so they're up here because all the areas around are, are submerged. So they're up here on essentially on dry land. This is um, the New Orleans jail. So these are all prisoners. <laughs> So this is, this day is probably about 97, 98% humidity. Haven't had water in a while. Some of these folks arrested for dumbass reasons. Some of them murderers, right? It's everybody you would encounter in jail. Sitting out without any shade and a bunch of guys with shotguns, right? These are stressful conditions to say the least. Right? You might think, huh, why do we have a bunch of prisoners sitting out in the sun with no shade or, or protection three days after storm hit? That seems kind of weird. Shouldn't we have taken care of that in like the first 12 hours or 24 hours or something? Uh, you see, I saw all these signs like this. These folks are sitting here. They have no way out, right? They, they don't want to be there. They want to go to a safer place. Up here, um, we had emergency ref emergency shelters. Before the storm hit, you know, not before, like the year or so before the storm hit, in a reassessment, people said, hey, these places aren't safe. These places won't work in a major disaster. So don't go there. But the answer wasn't, don't go there, go here. It was just, don't go there. So when push came to shove and people's houses were flooded, they didn't know where to go. So they went to the Superdome, the football stadium, and they went to the convention center. This picture is in front of the convention center. All these kinds of folks are here without help, right? Without support, without housing, without medicine, without, without, without medical attention. Um, there's this lady's um, basically, I think this lady was the one that passed away, right? There's people dying here. Here, and we can't get our fellow citizens out of here. Again, this is BS wherever this would happen on the planet. This is unacceptable. But in our country that is so powerful, so wealthy, that we had just gone through a few years earlier, 9-11, restructured the entirety of our country under this idea of homeland security, um, Patriot Act, all this kind of stuff. And the bargain was, we're going to keep you safe if a terrorist attack, if a this or that. And this is nobody coming to help. These are journalists from Canada bringing water to folks. You know, thank God they did. But what the hell? This is, this is crazy times. So we have that social tension, that social challenge. Most of the time, most people are helping each other out. This isn't chaos and mass looting and, and raping and pillaging. It's not that, that's not what happened. There's some of that, but very little. But you'll see when I, when I play, show you guys stuff to watch, that notion of, oh my God, everybody's rabid, everybody's shooting people, there's snipers all around, it was all bullshit. It didn't happen, but the police thought it was happening. So the way they responded was with uh, bulletproof vests and, and all that kind of stuff because they thought that was what was happening, right? So again, this misinformation has all kinds of consequences. 
Uh, but as this happens, the infrastructure is, is destroyed and catching on fire and doing all the horrible stuff. So here is, this is from Alabama, but here's a, a tanker just sitting on the freeway. How do you, how do you get a tanker off the road, right? Like, what the hell? That's a hard thing to do. Um, here's another part of a platform that came on shore, oil and gas platform, guy kayaking around. Gazillion million oil spills, some very small, some very large. Everywhere is an oil spill. Um, this is a refinery on fire, chemical refinery on fire. So this is, a, this is you know, very, very challenging conditions. And unfortunately, uh, we had a lot of out of touch leadership. And so here are a couple quotes. This is uh, the then uh, first lady, Barbara Bush. Um, and she uh, went to tour. So one of the places we brought, uh, we brought evacuees to various places, but two of the most common ones, because they're nearby, Atlanta and Houston were, were very um, popular evacuation centers. And so in the case of um, uh, uh, the folks in Houston, uh, First Lady Bush goes up to the uh, kids and people that are in essentially the, the, the football field, the baseball field. Um, and she says, what I'm hearing, which is sort of scary, is that they all want to stay in Texas. Everyone is so overwhelmed by the hospitality. And so many of the people in the arena here, you know, we're underprivileged anyway, so this is work, working very well for them, right? Was she trying to be an a-hole? I don't think she was trying to be an a-hole. But you can see the assumptions there, right? These people, this is working out well for them because they're poor. Like, what the F, right? I mean, come on. Here's another quote. And so this is, this is the then... Um, uh, the, the before he was indicted, <laughs> uh, this was the then um, uh, uh, Republican um, uh, leader of the House. Same thing, I'm walking around to, talking to his voice. And again, trying to be nice, trying to be helpful. But he said, he's talking to these, these couple little kids on a cot. He says, now tell me the truth, boys. Isn't this kind of fun? Right? Just very out of touch uh, leadership. Here's some more quotes. So um, one of the most craziest, there's just so much crazy stuff that happens. So Michael Brown, who's a director of Federal Emergency Management Agency, whose whole disaster emergency experience before this is being the lawyer for an Arabian horse breeding association, but donated a lot of money to the president's campaign. And then did a little bit of lawyer, like lawyer services for one of his local, local disaster um, um, City, city emergency services thing. We put this guy in charge of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, right? Um, the Federal Emergency Man Management Agency was created if, if the, uh, um, in the Carter administration to pull together um, agencies so that we could more effectively respond to disasters. It became in much of the subsequent 80s and early 90s, essentially by all accounts, not very good, right? It started out pretty good, wasn't very effective. It became a political dumping ground. Um, under President Clinton, he brought in a guy named uh, 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 Witt, and he was a, a actually a disaster professional. So he was the first guy in you know almost 20 years that actually had an emergency preparedness background. And he did a lot of great stuff. He did a lot of overhauling and everything. But when the Clinton administration left, Michael Brown came back in and returned to this pattern of, of incompetent leadership, I, I think it's fair to say. And so this is one of his emails that was released after the fact with a, with a, um, uh, a Freedom of Information Act. So he's getting ready to go on national television and he's, he's emailing his colleague and he says, uh, if you look at my lovely female attire, you'll really vomit. Uh, I'm a fashion god. Anything specific I need to do or tweak? You know of anyone who dog sits? Can I quit now? Can I come home? I'm trapped now, please rescue me, right? So he's, you know, there's all kinds of gallows humor and we need some amount of humor when these disaster situations to be sure. But um, the way this guy was behaving um, was not consistent with uh, emergency professional. And the classic quote, one of the most classic quotes for all of the responses to Hurricane Katrina or in the immediate aftermath, um, President Bush uh, eventually comes to town and, and, and he's sitting there talking and he says to, um, to Michael Brown, because he had a nickname for everybody, the suspicion is because he couldn't remember people's names very well, but regardless, um, so he called him Brownie. 
right? And so he said, Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. And that became a, a, a very unfortunate quote that would haunt President Bush ever, after he made it. Every single late night comedian, it became a meme. It was, it was, it was this crazy stuff. And so, um, so there's, there's increasing anger, like why are there people without food and water? What's going on? Da, 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 da. And, and then uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi says, uh, who's not, was not the Speaker of the House at the time, she says, you know, President Bush, you gotta, we gotta do something. We gotta help some out and we're not doing stuff right. And he says, what didn't go right? Again, very hard to square this circle that, that, that people are dying on live national television and some people are saying like, hey, can you check on my clothes? Do I have the right color purple on? And I mean, it was totally crazy. Um, uh, the, the head of Homeland Security, in the wake of 9-11, FEMA becomes a sub part of uh, a component agency of Homeland Security. The head of Homeland Security is a guy named Michael Chertoff, who now works for a company selling things to the federal government. But at the time he was the, the head of Homeland Security. and and on, on live radio, as there's people stuck, and, and you, you're seen on, on the television, the, the um, reporter says, hey, so um, what's going on? How, are we getting food and water to these people? And the head of Homeland Security says, I've not heard a report of thousands of people in the convention center who, didn't, who don't have food or water. And the reporter goes on to say, have you not looked at your television the last couple of days? What do you mean you haven't heard of this? I mean, it, it's, it, these, these statements are, it's hard to communicate how massively out of touch they were. And it just kept coming. It wasn't like one guy said something accidentally and then whatever. It was just like, that guy said that. And then she said that. And the next day, like, oh my God, did you hear what that guy said? And then this guy said that. And it, it, was, like, it was like a nonstop parade of incompetence as people are struggling as we're not responding it was it was just absolutely outraged um so uh we get uh, all kinds of consequences come from this one of the first ones that everybody points out or rightly so is the racial dimension to this so uh the area here uh that is sort of golden colored is where after uh uh hurricane katrina um we see more white folks uh, uh, hanging out. And the, the other blocks are where there's more African-American folks. And, um, and, and so essentially, uh, as we've seen time and time again, the white folks are the wealthier folks. They have the better houses. In New Orleans, the better houses are the ones that are on higher land. So the folks most ostracized by society, least empowered, they get pushed off to the peripheries, right? In this case, the periphery is lower elevation land. And so when flooding does happen, they bear the brunt of it, right? In 2005, this is called um, concentrated poverty neighborhoods. So this is an area where you hear like the wrong side of the track, right? Where like, that's the bad part of the neighborhood. That's the bad part of town. This is the good part of town, right? Where there's clear delineations, clear segregations between poor communities and wealthy communities geographically within the, within the city. And so we call that um, concentrated poverty neighborhoods. And in 2005, New Orleans was the second, had the second highest concentration of poverty neighborhoods in the US. The only other, and this is like a town that are like 100,000 people or more, I think is what the, the number is. The only one that's worse, Fresno here in California. So before the storm hit, before any of this thing played out, there was existing huge problems, you know, societal, social, economic problems that were undergirding this. So this was all the, the you know, the teed up and then the storm came in and boom, and just exacerbated uh, things just like COVID, right? Just like COVID. So already had all these tensions, problems, and then COVID comes in and makes it even more problematic. Much of the initial response is cast in the light of a, sort of a racial dimension. And one of the first things that happens is this. So this starts making the rounds. So the idea here is when we see black folks taking stuff out of a store, it's referred to as looting. 
when white folks are doing the same thing, it's called finding, right? This is actually bullshit. This isn't true. Well, let me take it back. So this, this becomes a huge story and people start talking about this. But when you actually go back and look at the data, there's no evidence of the systemic uh, calling black folks looters and white folks finders or whatever. But because of our existing racial tensions, right? And real race and very real racial problems, this observation not backed by fact, only anecdote becomes part of the storyline, right? So that's also then people are like outraged, people are saying this and reporters start getting attacked and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, uh, we're almost out of time here. So I'll just say that the recovery, so there was this existing problems, the storm hits, exacerbates the problems. The recovery is also uneven. So the neighborhoods that come back the best and, and, and communities that pop back the fastest are the most, are the wealthiest, are the whitest, et cetera. And so that plays out in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so I'll just say that uh, there's this famous book from a few years ago uh, about sociological metaphors for disasters and, 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 and government failing to see ahead of time this, this looming problem. And so in this book, they talk about the, the sinking of the Titanic, the way we designed it, that it hit an iceberg and it sank and people like, that's fine. Um, there's this famous Chicago heat wave in 95, New Orleans during and after Katrina, I think would count, Gulf Coast during and after the Deepwater Horizon. And I would suggest that now we have the global example of, of response to COVID. And so these, these disasters really are a metaphor and really are highlighting deeper problems in our environmental policy and our environmental behavior and our socioeconomic policy, all, that, all those dimensions. And so we've been coming in and doing this stuff, uh, you know, since then, these are our students working in Beerus where the, um, this was uh, the first three years we mostly did for the, so we, we've been doing the wetland work every year. The first three years we did demolishing and, and rebuilding and things of that nature. Um, and so that, this is a picture of our students doing some of that. So we're, we're clearing out a place and, and she's knocking down this wall. Um, the third year we went, everybody's money was run out. I mean, a lot of places ran out way before that, but by year three, nobody had any money. Very similar to last semester with COVID, right? So the first year of COVID, it sucked and it was horrible and we're all on Zoom and everything, but it's like, okay, come the fall, we're gonna be back to face-to-face -face classes. And we kind of were, but we kind of weren't. And as you guys all know, everybody's energy was just like, I'm done. Right, people were just exhausted, and people's people's mental energy was done. Their their souls were done. Their their money, their bank accounts were done. And so, so for us, that really became very very clear that by year three, this is what was happening. So we would show up to places to do work for the day. You know, before this, we'd show up and they go, "Here's a crowbar. Go knock that wall down." Like, uh, wait, I don't know if school said. And the students like, "Yeah, knock the wall down." I'm like, oh, shit, knock the wall down. Like, okay, so we're knocking the wall down today. Um, and uh, and like I remember this project at one point, this lady goes, "Anybody know how to drive a tractor?" And my one student's like, "I know how to drive a tractor." He goes, "Go get on there!" And the guy jumps on this bobcat, and I'm like, "Wait!" He shot, and I'm like, "Oh!" He's like, "Brr!" Knocking the wall. I'm like, "Okay." So it goes for a while, and I said, "We break for lunch." I'm like, "So where do you learn to drive a tractor?" I never. He said, "I never drove a tractor before. I thought it'd be fun." And so you know, like that's I'm like. Oh. Yeah, I hope campus never hears about that. So like, you know, we're just jumping in to help folks, right? Here to help folks. And so they would say, hey, here's some paint. Can you guys paint the wall? We're like, oh, we'll paint the wall. And they would say things like, can you do the electrical wiring? I'd be like, oh, wait, you know, these are college students. I'm not necessarily electric. Anyway, so, um, so, but by year three, what had happened was we'd show up and they go, oh yeah, sorry, we ran out of money. Like, okay, what do you need to do? Can you guys go buy paint for us? And, and we just don't have the resources to go, you know, buy a thousand dollars worth of lumber or something like that. So it became, so that year we didn't make a whole lot of progress in terms of the, the physical rebuilding. And so that's when uh, John, uh, Dr. Lambrinos, my, my colleague from Oregon State, we decided like, hey man, we gotta do something different. One, it was great to physically do the demolishing and everything that was, that was, that was cool and helpful, but that's not really our jam. Right? That's not really our expertise as, as ESRM, as, as environmental professionals, right? 
And so that's when we hit upon the idea of, hey, these folks are having a hard time. What if we start working on food systems? And even though uh, you know, we don't focus on ag here at our school or in our program, um, it, it was much closer to what we did. And so after that third year, we pivoted. So now half of our time or, or roughly about half, we do wetlands. It kind of varies each year, but you know, we have the wetland stuff. And then rather than doing home rebuilding, we work on, on food provisioning. So planting gardens, redoing gardens, helping people harvest, that kind of stuff. And that's, and that's more of our jam. So we're not doing rebuilding uh, so much anymore. We're, but we are helping recover the, the human side of the system, just like the natural side of the system. This is in, uh, we all see, this is, um, this is our main restoration area. And uh, so you guys will all check that out. Super excited to take you guys there. So that's a little bit about, I think we're at time now, that's a little bit about what we're gonna be doing. So I will send you guys some links. I'll send you some, some other lectures you guys can watch on your own. Um, next week, we are going to be having uh, Dr. Uh, Tom Huggins, our colleague, will be coming with us. You'll love him. He's great. Um, and so Tom is a, a curator at the UCLA Herbarium. So he's a, a plant expert. We're going to be pulling out our own plant collections about four o'clock. We'll, we'll be here pulling stuff out. So when you guys come at five next week, we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk about the ecology of this forest that we're working on re restoring. And we'll start showing you guys some of the plants. So, um, it, you know, starting. So we'll spend some time just like looking, staring, blah, blah, blah. And it's okay if you don't memorize everything, but we want to start familiarizing you guys with some of the plants. Awesome. Well, I'm super stoked. I'm super stoked we have plane tickets. Woo! Wow. Super stoked. Super stoked we have money. Woo! Take you on the trip. Woo! -hoo! All right, great. So, um, so yeah, so work on uh, thinking about what your size is for car hearts. Go to Boot Barn. Go get some of those, get some gloves, all that good stuff. I will see everybody uh, next week. You guys have a great week.